everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Richard Jagger. I'm the CEO of Biogene. Thank you very much for coming along and spending your time today with us, and we're hopefully we can reward that, not just with a sandwich, but um, with some interesting information about the company. Um, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping first. We'll be, this will be done in kind of two sections, and I thought it was valuable to do an update on the company and where we're at based on our roadmap that we put out at the end of last year, uh, and then we'll move into our um, guest speaker, Catherine, and what she will be talking about as we go forward from there. Um, I want to let you know that we will be taping the presentation for people who aren't able to make this. We wanted to make it available, um, or if you want to go over it again. So we'll be, we, we're going to try and stand in this one spot so we don't block the screen for the camera. Um, so if I move around a bit, people might start waving me around and happy for you to do that if we need to. Um, so, so just so you're aware of that, um, so keep the applause to a minimum if you can so that, so that the microphones can pick up the noise. Um, what I might do is introduce Catherine before I start so you know, we don't have too much of a lag in between. Um, Catherine Hill, Professor Catherine Hill, as you're probably aware, is a professor of entomology at Purdue University in the US. Um, she has a couple of titles, and I'm going to read those because um, they're important. Uh, besides being a professor, she's the Showalter Faculty Scholar, and she's also a fellow, uh, the President's Fellow for Life Sciences, um, which is a bit more general across the university, um, which is a prestigious role as well. Catherine is an Australian, uh, but has been in the US for nearly 20 years now, and I think uh, close to 15 years at Purdue. Um, importantly for us, her, her background and knowledge of the industry and the work that she focuses on, which is really the development of new insecticides for treatment of um, humans and animals, is really relevant to what we're doing and what we need to do. And, and besides the work that her lab has done, her ability to connect us with industry and the people we need to is going to be very important going forward. I've got a little announcement that you might have seen this morning, I'll talk about in a minute, um, that we put out this morning. So if you haven't seen that, you might uh, be able to flip that up on, the, on, the, on your screens later on. Um, have I missed anything, Roger, you happy with that in housekeeping? All right. So what I'll, I'll do, I hope to only spend you know, under 10 minutes talking about where we're at as, as the company going forward. Um, through this year. So when we, and I hope you can read the back, I'm sorry, I've tried to make it as large as I can, but I'll try and talk through it. When we did our roadmap in December last year and published that, we wanted people to be aware of really what the, the work we're going to focus on this year. And it's really about that building the value proposition for our technology, really understanding what we've got, what the potential product is that we're going to deliver, and who the, who the target should be of who we want to go and talk to about commercial partners and evaluation. So a lot of that work that we're doing today, or at the moment, is really about that understanding and developing know-how and knowledge about how our products work and where they're going to be valuable in the industry. So first of all, the first um, task is to identify appropriate potential partners for product evaluation and development. That's essentially the commercial companies around the world, big ag, etc., that will want to look at this technology, we hope, and work with us on evaluating how it can fit into their systems and provide solutions to their um, portfolio needs. We, want to keep, we wanted to demonstrate the activity of our lead molecules, flaviside, the synthetic product, and Qside, the natural product, in an increased number of target pests. We want to implement the regulatory required toxicology and environmental safety studies required for the product registration filings. Obviously moving towards registration is very important. We need to continue to develop improved production process for both the natural and synthetic products to make sure we can make them to scale, make them as cost effective as we can. We also will continue to evaluate and clarify specifics around our unique mode of action. We talk a lot about this. Those who have seen me present before will know that this is something that I see as really valuable and distinctive about our technology, is how our product works differently to other products in the market and why that will be of value to our customers. We need to continue to generate data to support additional intellectual property creation and protection, continue to support our technology around the IP and what we own, and we want to recruit leading scientific and industry experienced scientists to a scientific advisory board. They're the people external who are real experts in their fields that can help evaluate the data that we're getting, steer us in the right direction of people we need to talk to and, and know, uh, and, the, and even the companies we need to be dealing with. 
So that's what we um, th that's the aim that we put out for ourselves, the benchmark, if you like, for this year. So let's talk a little bit about um, progress to date. I, I thought it was worth mentioning, even though it happened before we put this roadmap map out. Of course, we had a successful uh, listing in November. Um, I, I think that was a great. Um, achievement and milestone for the company and certainly for people that have been backing us for a long time and the, and the faith that those people had in getting this company to this point I hope was realised in the fact that we're able to do that. So a big thank you to all of the people involved in helping us as a business get us to that point. Commercially, uh, we have started introductions to the AgChem world, um, a lot through my connections, really about introduction and making sure people are aware of what's going on and they can start to follow the story. A little bit early yet to talk about the real detail about specific product opportunities, but we want them to be aware of what's going on and to keep an eye on, on the work that we're doing. Um, efficacy. So this is how the product works. Um, obviously we have a number of research contracts in place to test our molecules and across the areas of, of pests that attack crops, mosquitoes obviously for public health and, and consumer uh, health issues. Uh, grain storage pests, that's uh, pests that uh, attack grain in storage situations. And we have some early results in for red-legged earth mites. You may recall we did an announcement about that that a group did here in Melbourne called CESAR. Uh, and we're going to discuss the, the Purdue results on the um, mosquito Aedes aegypti um, uh, species today as well. Catherine will take us through that. We're awaiting some interim reports from QDAF. They're the people in Queensland, the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries doing the work on our grain storage pests. That's very close to being kind of wrapped up as a first phase. Uh, and Eurofin's an organisation, it's actually a global organisation, but work done here and in Southeast Asia, doing some work on some specific pests for us as well. Um, and we hope to have some reports from them very shortly. We'll also start working on uh, the other, uh, some other short-term projects around ticks, mosquitoes, uh, and, and additional crop pests, a number of those we're looking at as well. Safety on the toxicology side, we've started the 28-day tox study. It's what we call a sighting study. It helps set up the kind of dosage levels we need to look at as we go deeper into this area. Of course, it's all about safety, and we're all interested in that, making sure the products that we bring to market are safe um, for the environment and for the, uh, the world around us, I guess. Manufacturing, uh, we've been working very closely with CSIRO. You might have uh, been aware of that. We're just about to complete a stage two um, a study with some really interesting results on that, and that will lead into kind of uh, defining what we do with them on the next step. It's all about how we improve that process of making this rather complicated molecule, um, and importantly, what we can do um, around achieving some intellectual property around that and reducing the cost and uh, complexity of being able to produce that molecule. Also importantly that we keep kind of pro um, progressing our knowledge and ability to produce the natural product. Being a natural product there's its own complications and we've started discussions with some people in far north Queensland that can help us, we believe, in developing better processes and better trees in order to be able to get the most out of those and the most product that we need. Mode of action, a uh, company based in the UK uh, but also here at Monash University Neurosolutions, uh, their final report, we've really just received on that and that will help us define how we go further with that. Um, it's an interesting one. We don't want to talk too much about this in detail because there's a lot of intellectual property, a lot of potential for uh, patent material, and etc. that we want to maintain. So we've always tried to be a little bit stealthy about this area, but it's, it's really promising and... Um, not only with NeuroSolutions, but a lot of the stuff that Catherine will talk about will, is helping define what it is and what it isn't, uh, I guess, compared to other molecules in the marketplace. <coughs> On intellectual property side of things, um, we've got a number of research organisations that are currently developing data that will support our um, applications. We have a timeline on this, so those applications or submissions have to go in in July. Uh, and the data we obviously create has to be there before that so um, we can support those applications. But that's uh, uh, progressing and well on the way as well. Uh, importantly, coming to the point that we announced this morning about our scientific advisory board, just yesterday um, Professor Hill uh, had signed off on the agreement to have her as our founding member of the scientific advisory board. It's very exciting for us and we really do 
feel very honoured that she's agreed to spend some more time talking with us about our project in general. So obviously this scope will go beyond the particular work that Purdue is doing and she's going to talk in that kind of capacity today about um, an advisor and really relating that to the Purdue work. Um, but that's a very big coup for us. She's got some great connections uh, to the world market and is very well respected. So we're very lucky to have that. I also, I'm very excited that Peter May, who's been a consultant and a board uh, member for a number of years now, has agreed to become an executive director in charge of what we call research and development. I call it all our science, right? So he's our guy that helps kind of keep all the balls in the air and keep across all of these different facets of science going. As you can imagine, it's a difficult job because we work with a lot of very specialist groups and very intelligent people. Um, and our job, and mainly Peter's, is to try and kind of understand that and really extrapolate it to what it means. So, uh, you know, with the help of the SAB, um, that's the kind of charge that Peter has in the organisation. And thank you, Peter, for agreeing to do that. And it's, and it's great that you're willing to step up and um, spend more time with us too. So next steps, um, really it's continuing to talk to these commercial companies, get them to understand what we're doing, what our projects are relating to, to kind of generate that interest and, and if you like, understanding of where we're going and, and uh, hopefully a little bit of angst to make sure that they get an opportunity to sit at the table and talk to us about specific solutions that could meet their portfolios. We'll continue our testing program on target pests and we'll publish those or announce those appropriately as we go forward. Some might be as individual pests, some would be a program base where it might involve a couple of pests depending on what the outcomes we're trying to see. So we are expecting to be able to put out a number of announcements through the near future on the work we're doing there. So I hope that will be exciting when that happens. Uh, we will complete our 28 day top study which allows us then to move into the next stage for flowerside. And we'll do what we call a six pack of tox studies. It's kind of a preliminary study on the Q-side, the natural product, to make sure that as we progress to a lot of testing and um, application work on that product, that we feel very comfortable that the people working with it and the environment we're putting it in uh, are not exposed to any issues or dangers. We don't expect there to be any problems, but it just makes good common practice to, to start off with those tests. Uh, with CSIRO, who are helping us with the manufacturing of the flavicide pro um, product, as I said, we're finishing stage two and we expect to be able to get more detailed on that in the next few months with their next stage. Uh, they're very excited about the work they're doing too and that's, that's great, that kind of, that energy rubs off on us as well. Uh, and we'll also work with uh, another institution we're hoping to sign up very shortly about the improvement of the Q-side, the natural oil production and how we continue to improve on that. This is my final slide. Uh, confirming our findings of mode of action. As I said, we've got, we've got an understanding of the mode of action through this neurosolution work. We're getting some confirmation through some other methodologies, um, and even some of the work Purdue University has done is really helping us with that. But we want to really dig down to the detail. And, and this is really important that we understand this, because uh, one of the findings, one of the, the outcomes we want is to try and get a new classific classification of chemistry that's uh, managed by a, an organisation called IRAC, and, and Catherine will talk a little bit about that shortly. But that puts us on a real um, visible path, if you like, for the world and for the industry to understand how our chemistry can be used to combat resistance or to work with existing or new chemistry. Uh, obviously, the patent submission data, we'll put that together, and with the help of our patent attorney, Catherine, who's here with us today, we'll be making that application in July. We'll continue to, to build our SAB with experts um, to work with Catherine and to work with Peter and, and our group and all our scientists uh, as we go forward. And importantly, we, you know, a lot of the institutions we're working with here in Australia have got great access to and knowledge about how we can uh, get access to government grants and that can help cover some of the costs of, this, um, of the testing and research that we're doing at the moment. And that's really important. You know, it's chunks of money here and there. It mightn't change the world for any of us individually, but for our company, every dollar is important. Everything we've all put into it is really important, and we want to try and maximise that as best we can. So what's great is that they're, they're very attuned now to helping small businesses and startups in uh, accessing grants as we go forward, and we're very confident we'll be able to uh, announce a few of those in the next few months as, as we sign up some people. 
Uh, and then importantly for everyone here, implementing the loyalty option program as outlined in the prospectus, you would remember that we're planning to have a, a one for five share loyalty program. The planned record date of that is the 7th of March. Um, so everyone kind of needs to be aware of that. We'll have some more information coming out about that before that date, yes. right, Rog? Yes, that's um, so, but and, and we're happy to field some questions at the end of the day on that, but that's kind of a really important date coming up for everyone too. That's the general outline I want to give. I know it was fairly fast, but I wanted to make sure we left enough time for Catherine to talk about her area. Um, I'll just ask, are there any general questions on that that I can field at the moment? Uh, Richard, you, you mentioned sort of the, uh, the, the storage of crops and some of the pests there. Um, we're talking rats? No, these are, these are weevils in, in general. Um, and mites. And beetles. beetles. They're coleopterous, right? Yeah. Um, so they're, no, they're not rats, they're not mammals, they're, they're um, small, in, small and, insects and pests. And, you know, do we go to sort of you know, the crop level where aphids and uh, Absolutely. locusts? And so a lot of the work, what we call cr um, crop protection, uh, you know, the insects that will fly in and, and damage or destroy crops, and we're testing those as well. And there's, there's kind of a a number of about 12 serious crop pests around the world that we're trying to focus on, about nine of those at this stage. Getting access to those and uh, resistant strains of those is one of the challenges, organisations that work with those, and that's one of the things that we've got to identify the right organisations that work with us. But, yeah, definitely through that area is a big part of our market. Um, we would say it's around about a $16 billion US uh, market that we spend on crop protection products uh, globally. So, you know, a portion of that would be significant for us. So we're certainly doing a lot of work in that. The red-legged red earthlight was the first to that program. Right, yeah. So more an Australian pest, but becoming more of an issue as resistance spreads across the country from west to east is this little pest, red-legged earth mite, in cereals mainly. Um, our results are very, very promising to date, as you would have hopefully read or you can reread in our announcement. Um, but that's certainly a crop protection pest and one that... Um, we hope you know, we'll generate into a, a commercial opportunity. The uh, item six, the extension of the preparation, extension of the <coughs> of the patents. Is yes. That all of the existing patents are being varied, or uh, an idea how far you're going to push the patent? So, so the current <laughs> patents that we have uh, are due to run out in 2022. They have five years to go. So now, as we all are aware, that's not a very long time when we still have research to do and we want to go out in the world and have commercial uh, products and have the proprietor around that so people have to come and deal with us. Um, but what we're able to do is to do... And forgive me, Catherine, I will get wording and stuff wrong and I'm happy for you to correct me, but it's complementary patents that we can do around how the technology that we have works and on what kind of pests and... Um, and in what kind of situations. So around resistance, except, uh, for example, how it controls pests, that's the kind of angle we're taking. So a lot of the research is really observing how our chemistry works on resistant pests, how it might work in interaction with other chemistries, um, and then you know even some other observable effects that a lot of our um, research institutions are finding that are a little bit unusual can o often result in a patentable um, discovery, if you like. Is that okay? I haven't stepped over the line with anything there. It's obviously a real science in itself, patent area. Um, all right, um, and we're happy to come back then. What we're going to do, as I mentioned, where we're going to record this. Um, so what I might ask you to do, if, if you would, is to, is to keep questions for, for Catherine until the end of her presentation. But perhaps if I can now, I'd like you to all welcome Catherine to the stage. Um. Thank you to Richard and thank you to the Biogene team for the opportunity to address you today and to speak to you about a topic that I'm very passionate about uh, and that is uh, mosquitoes and ticks and the, and the diseases that they transmit. I'm going to give you a couple of presentations today. So the first uh, is uh, as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board and we'll be talking a little bit about the importance of vector-borne diseases and the market opportunities for a company like Biogene in the public health space. 
And then I'm going to take that hat off and, and put on my Peru uh, faculty hat and talk a little bit about uh, some of the key findings and observations that we've made uh, from studies that have been conducted in my laboratory at Peru. So I'm very excited to be here. It's lovely to be back in Australia. I grew up in Adelaide. I'm a Port Adelaide football club supporter, not that other team from South Australia. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm very pleased to uh, accept the appointment to the Scientific Advisory Board and to be working with Biogene. Um, we have been working with them now for since April of 2017 and it's been a great experience. These guys are great on the science side and they're great on, on the business side as well. So. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the diseases that are, are transmitted by ticks and mosquitoes. I'd like to paint a picture for you here about the importance uh, of these diseases and their impact on global public health. Um, I think it's, it's perhaps uh, something that, that you hear about occasionally but maybe are not um, aware of uh, just how serious this problem is and how precarious is our ability to control and contain uh, these diseases diseases and prevent um, epidemics. So I'm just going to share some of the statistics with you. Um, the WHO uh, reported in 2015 that more than half of the world's population, the global population, is at risk of acquiring a disease transmitted by a vector, by a mosquito, a tick, a kissing bug, a tsetse fly for instance. And that's because the vast majority of the world's population lives in, in, in tropical and subtropical regions of the world um, where they come into contact um, with those vectors. Uh, Vector-borne diseases account for about 500,000 deaths uh, in, around the world uh, every year. Um, that's a 2015 statistic. It used to be a lot higher than that. It used to be over 1 million. And, and thankfully, um, efforts from philanthropic organisations such as the Gates Foundation to try to reduce malaria um, have had a significant impact on that. But uh, I, I don't think we can be complacent. I think we have a very real opportunity for those numbers to creep up again. And I'll explain why shortly. Um, Vector-borne diseases account for about one-sixth of the illness and disability that we see worldwide. 25% of all emerging diseases that you see on the planet are transmitted by vectors. And many of these diseases are considered re-emerging. And that is, uh, by, by that I mean we thought we had them under control. Unfortunately, they're now resurging and we're losing our ability to control them. These diseases are, are associated with morbidity, with death, but they're also associated with mortality, excuse me, they're associated with mortality, but they're also associated with morbidity, which is a reduction in your quality of life, and that's very important. And, and importantly too, they exacerbate poverty and prevent economic development, and, and malaria and the impact of malaria in Africa is an excellent example of that. What are these diseases? You've um, heard of them before. You see them in the news um, and uh, you see these names uh, all the time. Many of these are diseases that potentially can occur in Australia. Malaria, dengue, yellow fever, I'm sure you all heard about Zika. Chikungunya, some of you might not have heard of that one. Japanese encephalitis, um, Murray Valley, Ross River, Lyme disease. It's a big long list and if you're a vector biologist like myself, this list seems to be growing and growing and growing all the time and it's really hard to keep track of, um, of all of the diseases. I'd like to have you think a little bit about the emerging global problem that we have with vector-borne diseases. Uh, for folks living in developed countries, um, we've had, for the last 50 to 60 years, we've lived uh, relatively disease-free thanks to modern medicine, uh, modern construction. Um, but that, that situation is changing slightly and um, Peter Doherty from the uh, Doherty Institute and, and an Aussie Nobel Laureate uh, has a very nice quote and he says, we are facing a new era in infectious diseases and preparedness is key. And the reason that, um, that we are in this new era is that uh, our, our human population is massively expanding or increasing. We are uh, destroying habitats, um, we are moving around the globe, and we are coming into contact um, with insects uh, in a way that we haven't um, before. So our population growth, our urbanisation, 
loss of habitat, climate change, travel, they're all increasing the human vector contact and so increasing the chance for transmission uh, of diseases. And many of the folks in my field are very concerned about this and believe that this is a situation uh, that will continue to um, become more severe. And you just see there the global uh, map, the world map, uh, redrawn uh, based on human population numbers. So you can see uh, the areas of the globe where we expect uh, to have uh, largest, po or do have largest population growth. And many of these areas are where we have transmission of vector-borne diseases. Uh, another thing to think about here, and this is very important, is that is arthropod vectors, mosquitoes in particular, are really, really adept at exploiting habitats that we create. They love to live in urban environments in close proximity to humans. And, and when we change or modify an environment, we create great habitats uh, for vectors to exploit. Um, and particularly container habitats that collect rainwater um, in our, our urban environments are, are very good places uh, to attract uh, and grow large numbers of, of mosquitoes. So this is a problem of our own making um, and the more that we grow our, our population centres and increase our urbanisation, the more um, we exacerbate this problem. And I'd like to show you this picture here just to, sort of, to bring home that point a little further. Um, you're looking at a, a global map um, where the, the red or orange shading uh, shows you the distribution of Aedes aegypti, which you heard Richard mention uh, in some earlier slides. Aedes aegypti is commonly known as the yellow fever mosquito. It's the mosquito that's responsible for transmission of yellow fever, dengue and Zika viruses. Um, and its global range is expanding or increasing. It's moving into new habitats as our climate patterns change and as we modify habitats and increase our human population numbers. Um, <clears throat> And so this means that our risk for acquiring mosquito-borne diseases is increasing, including in countries such as Australia, particularly in the, in the northern uh, areas of the country. Um, and I'd like to make a comment here um, that there are, are great opportunities uh, for um, developing products uh, to control the vectors of, of disease. Um, there's, uh, this, the global pesticide market in 2008 was valued at about $50 billion. Um, and of course, there are some um, strong emerging markets um, across Asia, particularly in, in India and China, where we have uh, emergence of a very strong middle class that um, will not tolerate transmission of disease and is, is willing to pay for products. Um, and there's a very strong demand, or a trend I think that is important to know about, and that is the strong demand for natural products and, and biocidal um, molecules uh, that have less environmental impact and are more uh, tolerated, I guess you would say. Um, I'm just going to, um, so we, we mentioned that vector-borne diseases are, are on the rise and this is uh, an example of a vector-borne disease uh, that you might have heard about in 2016-2017 and it's an example of a disease that was new. So many vector-borne diseases we consider re-emerging and one of those would be dengue. Zika is a vector-borne disease transmitted by mosquitoes that we consider is new. Um, it actually has been around for a while but for the first time in 2016 we saw uh, it explode across Latin America or, or Central and South America and it made its way into the United States. Um, and uh, you can see here some, some children uh, in an area where uh, somebody is fumigating uh, pesticide to control uh, the Zika mosquito. And, and there are lots of reasons we're, we're worried about Zika. Um, it's the disease that you may have heard um, is responsible for um, affecting development, um, the, the brain development uh, of, of children who are infected in utero. Um, but it also comes with a huge uh, financial burden to the healthcare system. The lifetime healthcare cost uh, estimated uh, for looking after a, a child that was infected with Zika in utero is four to ten million dollars US. And if we we were project, projecting about twenty thousand babies born per year uh, in the US potentially infected with Zika, so you can easily see why um, this becomes a massive, massive burden on on very well developed healthcare systems. It's also the reason that US Congress um, elected to invest one point two billion dollars into Zika funding. It was a very exciting time as a scientist. We wrote a lot of grants, 
um, that year. <laughs> and uh, this is Tom Fryden, who was then the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and he made the statement, Zika is a sobering long-term problem for the United States. Um, and yes, it sort of disappeared a little bit off the radar, but then it's popped back up again as we've, we've realised that there are some very long-term neurological consequences for infection with Zika. Um, dengue is an example of a mosquito-borne disease that we consider re-emerging. Um, many years ago, we sort of assumed we had dengue under control, but in the last 50 years, we've seen a 30% increase in the incidence of dengue. And we estimate that about 4 billion people are at risk of contracting dengue. Um, if you live in Northern Australia, you have a higher, higher chance of becoming infected with dengue. There are about 400 million cases per year. Um, and about uh, 500,000 of those cases are what we call dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is a very severe form of the disease. And you heard me say the term hemorrhagic, so it is associated with some rather unpleasant um, symptoms and, and some, some death, unfortunately. So this is a global map just showing you um, where we see cases of dengue um, recorded 2016 to 2017. And just to convince you that this is a disease on the rise, uh, now you can see um, the human case numbers uh, reported out um, by decade and then from 2008 to 2011, you'll see a, start, a sharp uh, increase uh, in the numbers. So very much a disease that we are concerned about um, and is considered a re-emerging. Um, to scare you even a little bit more, um, we also worry a lot about tick-borne diseases um, and uh, ticks are great at, at transmitting a number of different parasites and pathogens around the globe. Um, this was an article from the scientific journal Nature talking about the growing global battle against blood-sucking ticks. Very much a problem in Europe. Um, and across Asia, uh, the Americas, and of course in Australia as well. And many ticks are either pests of public health or they're pests of livestock, companion animals, production animals, and wildlife. So very, very good um, parasites. Um, and this, I uh, just show this because um, I think it's a, it's an interesting headline. A couple of years ago, we had um, a disease that emerged in the United States. It was called Bourbon disease. It had absolutely nothing to do with Bourbon or the state of Kentucky. Um, it was identified uh, cases occurred in another state. Um, but we, uh, the CDC worked out that it was, it was a virus transmitted by ticks. And this is happening all the time. It seems that we are constantly discovering new uh, diseases transmitted by, by ticks. And a colleague of mine at Indiana University, Keith Clay, says we're constantly discovering new bacteria and viruses in ticks. It's, it just goes on and on. So um, we've really got our eye on the ticks. And, and then one more scary slide. No, actually, there's a few more scary slides. <laughs> um, so I'd also like to... Um, uh, tell you something I think it is a little bit sobering and not many people realize this currently our control of mosquito-borne diseases relies on only four classes of chemistries and these are the synthetic pyrethroids the organophosphates the carbamates and the organochlorines and you know one organochlorine quite well that's DDT um, and it's not registered for use in a lot of places so, so these are the only classes of chemistries that we have available for controlling mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit. Um, and that is a real concern to many of us. Um, that, that feels pretty precarious. Um, and I'm going to tell you um, why that has happened. Um, we used to have many more chemical options, but they are dwindling rapidly. I think the other thing that's important to note is that all of these chemistries are neurotoxic not only to invertebrates but also to vertebrates so they affect the nervous system uh, of, the, of the organism that comes in contact with them. So they are neurotoxic and they have long-term health consequences if your exposure is prolonged. So not, not nice. I think it's also important to know that insecticides are the backbone of control. A lot of times people will ask me, well, what about vaccines and, and medicines? Uh, the graph that you're looking at here uh, is a study from 2015 where, people, where scientists looked to find uh, what was responsible for malaria control. And the green and pink bars, uh, excuse me, um, the, the green and blue bars are very important here. These are indoor residual sprays, and you see that on the bottom right-hand side, and insecticide-treated bed nets on the top right-hand corner. 
So about 70% of malaria control is achieved through the use of insecticides to control the mosquito that transmits malaria. And then ACT, that bit in pink, that's artemisinin and combination therapy, these are drugs that are used against the um, malaria parasite. So only a small percentage of malaria control is actually achieved through drugs and we don't have a vaccine. So the backbone of control is insecticides. We see uh, in 2000, 2000 we had about 1.5 million deaths due to malaria um, and then you can see that we spend about $1.8 billion on indoor residual sprays and $2.8 billion on insecticide treated bed nets, um, as these are 2010 numbers, uh, in our attempt to control malaria and the mosquitoes that transmit it. And that's just malaria. Why do we have a limited number of chemical options? Well, the reason is that we are losing our ability to control insects with insecticides, and the reason for that is insecticide resistance. In insects are very, very uh, good at developing resistance to insecticides very quickly, and they can do it within one or several generations. And unfortunately, our indiscriminate use of insecticides, very high insecticidal pressure, leads to the rapid evolution of insecticide resistance. Uh, modern insecticides came about starting in the 1950s after the Second World War um, and you can see, uh, well this graph is showing you that since the introduction of modern insecticides, DDT etc etc, we now know of 586 species of insects that are resistant to 325 different insecticides. And we also, at the time these data were reported, we knew of five GMO crop plants um, that, had, um, that insects had developed resistance to. So these are crops that are, are expressing insecticides or insecticidal traits for insect control. So it happens quickly and we are undermining our own ability to control. Um, this is a global issue. <clears throat> Here looking at a global map where the red dots are populations of mosquitoes that are resistant uh, to the insecticides that are used for malaria control and particularly to synthetic pyrethroids. So it's right across the globe. Um, so a global issue and in the United States and here in Australia it's also a domestic issue. This is a, a quote from Tom Fryden again, again he, and this was uh, in direct response to the Zika outbreak in 2016. He said in Miami, aggressive mosquito control measures don't seem to be working as well as we would have liked and it is possible that the mosquitoes there are resistant to the insecticides that have been used. So the synthetic pyrethroid insecticides that are considered the front line for treating mosquitoes were not effective in Miami. A huge population, um, a centre of, of, of human population um, and, and quite a few Zika cases. And this was a real shock, a real shock. Uh, so the US considers that it has a limited arsenal to fight Zika mosquitoes and other vectors of disease because it's been undermined by insecticide resistance. And the response was also unfortunate. Um, so um, counties that were involved in controlling mosquitoes then opted for aerial spraying of NALED, which is an organophosphate. And it's much more toxic to a whole range of organisms than synthetic pyrethroids. And unfortunately then you saw all of these unintended consequences. So for instance, um, honeybee populations uh, that were killed off because of aerial spraying of the organophosphate to control uh, Zika. Uh, and this was just, just the honeybees, um, so nobody was really looking at, at all of the other populations of insects that might have been affected. So some really serious consequences when we have to switch <coughs> to more toxic uh, insecticides. <coughs> and. That was a, a public furor in the United States, so some folks were really upset. What are, what are our options? What is on the horizon? If we're running out of chemistries, what are our options? <clears throat> and here you see some people who are fogging for mosquitoes in India uh, to control uh, malaria. Uh, our greatest uh, option is without doubt uh, the development of improved uh, chemicals and chemistries such as are being developed by companies like Biogene. There are a whole host of other things that you'll often see uh, reported, many different strategies, sterilisation of, of, of insects, 
different mosquito traps and control devices. Uh, people are even talking about RNA interference based insecticides. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about those. And a lot of um, interest and investment in genetic control, so modifying <coughs> uh, mosquitoes genetically so that they die out or aren't able to transmit disease. But all of these things uh, are nowhere near as effective as, as chemistries or insecticides, or they are a very long way off in development. And you will. Uh, male sterilization, that's available now, isn't it, for mosquitoes? It is, yes. We can talk about that later, <laughs> if you'd like. I'll put that on my, on my uh, questions uh, list. So there are, are some options. Uh, there's one strategy that is available for mosquitoes and has been used in the field. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> But I'm thinking more broadly like sterile, or sterile insect technique that's been used um, particularly in South America. Um, that's very hard to do with, with mosquitoes. Um, but there are companies that are thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of folks are very interested in developing what we call smarter insecticides. Uh, and I think it's very important to point out that we have not developed any new public health insecticides for control of vectors in the last 30 years for disease endemic countries. And there are reasons why, and we can, we can talk about that. That is changing. So partly the mindset was that there wasn't a market for this, but that is, is certainly not the case. Um, and uh, I talked to you about the emerging markets. Um, <clears throat> In this, in this area, and particularly as more and more people in developed countries become exposed to vectors and vector-borne diseases, there is quite clearly a very strong market. Um, the market opportunities, we have a desperate need for replacement products that have a very novel mode of action. In other words, they don't act like a synthetic pyrethroid or an organophosphate or a carbamate, and they need to be more environmentally benign. We're looking for products that can break resistance, so products that are effective against populations of pests and particularly mosquitoes and ticks that have become resistant to existing products. That's very important. We need control uh, tools and options for control in situations where our existing products don't work. And, and these two things really are a very strong value proposition. Uh, there is uh, a philanthropic organisation called the uh, Innovative Vector Control Consortium that's very active uh, in this space. They're based in Liverpool in the UK um, and their, their primary goal is to develop insecticides for malaria control and they're looking for replacements for bed nets and um, and indoor residual sprays. And, and this is just interesting, and I, I share this with you to sort of give you an idea of how hard it is to find new insecticidal um, molecules and entities. Uh, so IVCC partnered with Big Pharma, so Bayer, BASF, Syngenta, and a whole host of other companies, and convinced them that they could uh, take uh, some molecules uh, off the shelf that had been shelved by industry. In other words, industry wasn't interested in developing those molecules, and take another look at them for vector control. And uh, in combination uh, with their industry partners, they screened more than 4.5 million compounds um, that were held across these companies. Um, and now in their pipeline, they're looking at nine active ingredients um, as, as sort of uh, new products for or replacement products for controlling malaria mosquitoes. Now we don't know how many of those will um, develop and, and progress uh, to market. Um, but you certainly need a lot of options in your pipeline because this is a, a tough business and not everything is, is going to have all of the properties that you want uh, as an, a successful insecticide. Um, so the question is can they develop replacement products um, to control malaria mosquitoes? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about IRAC. You heard uh, Richard mention this, and, and you know companies are certainly thinking about uh, intellectual property opportunities, um, and there are opportunities for making um, novel claims. And one of those areas um, is sort of listed here on this slide, and I'm, sh I'm sh sorry, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but IRAC stands for the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Um, it's, it's a committee composed of, of uh, individuals from all of the major ag chem companies, and their, their purpose is to uh, classify insecticides based on their mode of action um, and then to preserve uh, the utility of those insecticides within those classes. And what I've um, boxed here are uh, the major classes of insecticides um, and their mode of action uh, that we currently have today. So these are things like carbamates, synthetic pyrethroids, organophosphates, 
and then on, on one side there to the, to the right uh, you see um, the formamidine insecticide. So this is uh, the product Amitraz which is used for tick and mite control. Um, and I just want to sort of explain a little bit about um, mode of action because it provides a good introduction um, into some of the um, highlights that I will, I will share as regards our results from um, Peru. So what do we mean by mode of action? Um, I, what you're looking at here, it's a little bizarre, um, these are two nerves that are connecting. So um, the orange is the synapse between the two nerves. This is where um, the, the nerve impulse is uh, transmitted across the, the nerve junction and if you look here, let me see if this doesn't, oh it does point, oh it's backwards, well anyway, <laughs> um, if you, uh, synthetic pyrethroids and DDT operate in the presynapse, uh, or the, um, the uh, incoming neuron and they hit something called a voltage gated sodium channel and they disrupt that channel, that's how they work. Whereas organophosphates and carbamates operate in the middle of this diagram, they mess up an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which is important um, for activity of, of, of neural function. So we know the modes of action of those insecticides, and what we're looking for are molecules and products that don't act any, in any way similar to this at all. So they don't hit the voltage-gated sodium channel, and they don't mess up acetylcholinesterase. That's what we mean by new mode of action. So I'm just going to conclude this part of my talk talking about some trends. I'd like for you to become comfortable with the idea of vector-borne diseases being the new norm. They will become uh, more common um, and people in developed countries will increasingly encounter and deal with need to think about protecting themselves from vector-borne diseases. This is going to be a constant battle and it's going to require multiple tools. Um, but don't be fooled, we are going to have a reliance on insecticides for many, many years to come. Some people project for the next five decades. We will transition to smarter pest control technology, so these are technologies with novel modes of action that are more environmentally benign. I think we'll see an increasing use and tolerance for green chemistries. We will have some GMO strategies introduced, and the gentleman uh, back there, I think Chris, it was, um, Craig? started with a C. <laughs> um, uh, certainly some of those uh, strategies would be considered GMO strategies. For many diseases the um, outlook is quite promising, for some it's perhaps a little more dire and we need to proceed very cautiously. Some people are talking about eradication of diseases and eradication of mosquito species and that might sound attractive but it also might have some unintended consequences so we need to be very careful. I'm just going to switch gears now um, and share a little bit of our insights um, from research work that was conducted um, in my laboratory at Purdue. And um, Purdue is in the, in the Midwest, uh, just sort of south of Chicago. I'm very glad not to be there right now because I think it's about minus 10 degrees and there's lots of snow, so it's really lovely to be in Australia. Um, but we have been working with Biogene uh, for a number of months now and uh, we have a research contract in place uh, to look at, at sort of understanding the activity of their molecule against mosquitoes and ticks. And um, we have really enjoyed working with this molecule. It's been a really uh, interesting um, uh, formulation to investigate and we've had some surprises. Um, and so I'm going to share those with you. But I do need to say that this was a project funded by Biogene. So, and of course my disclaimer, these are my opinions um, and not the opinion of the university. Um, the reason that we can do many of these studies is that we have controlled environment facilities. And you'll, you'll hear me talk about um, work with insecticide resistant mosquitoes. Uh, it's very important that those mosquitoes are contained. They're not the sorts of organisms that we want to let out into the environment. Um, obviously if we did we might have a bit of a problem to control them. Um, and so this study was done um, in the Department of Entomology um, and uh, we have an insectary which you see um, here. Um, it's, it's humidified, it has a controlled day-night uh, light cycle and uh, the temperature is also controlled so it's perfect for growing sort of tropical or subtropical mosquitoes I guess you would say. And all of our tests are conducted here. 
Um, and we did two sorts of tests with mosquitoes. And I think I just want to sort of give you some insights into those tests. Um, these were all done with Aedes aegypti, which is the, the mosquito there you see. Uh, it's a female. Uh, she's taken a blood meal. So, um, and when she takes a blood meal, she has the opportunity to um, acquire a virus or, or a pathogen. Um, these mosquitoes are great at transmitting dengue, uh, Zika and yellow fever. And we have different strains. Uh, so some of those strains are susceptible to synthetic pyrethroids and other strains are resistant, quite resistant to synthetic pyrethroids. And we can then expose them to different, different chemistries and to flavos flavosone um, to see how they respond. And we do that one of two ways. Um, we work with the larvae or the immature stages. Remember, some mosquitoes are aquatic. They have a, a stage that lives in water. Um, so we, we can actually do this in a plate. So it actually becomes quite relatively high throughput, which is very nice. And then we can also test the adults. And it's a little bit hard to see, but you have a microscope here um, with a mosquito um, anesthetized under the microscope. And she's receiving a small dab of insecticide on her back. And then she goes into a cup um, and we keep her for 48 hours to see what happens to her. And I just I would like to share with you some highlights or some insights around the efficacy of flavosone uh, against mosquitoes and against an important vector of disease to give you a sort of feel for maybe some, some potential uh, for this molecule uh, or the formulation in the public health pest space. So we see that flavosone um, has, uh, very, it, it has a lot of activity both against mosquito larvae and adults. And, and that sort of indicates to us that it has the potential for development either as a larvicide or an adulticide. And we are looking for products in both of those markets. We need, we need products in both of those areas. A very interesting finding and one that we did not expect, this was quite a surprise for us, is that flavosone is very rapidly toxic to mosquitoes. In fact, it outcompetes or outperforms um, the synthetic pyrethroids and organophosphates at the test doses um, we uh, used. And we really did not expect this. It's a very quick effect, um, and the mosquitoes are uh, instantly knocked down um, and, and essentially, well, they never recover. Um, and so that, that rapid activity uh, leads us to ask the question, are there opportunities, unique opportunities for product development around that particular uh, aspect of flavosone? Here's another really important point. Uh, flavosone shows activity against uh, synthetic pyrethroid mosquitoes. So it has the potential to be used as a resistance breaking replacement product and also to be used in combination with existing uh, uh, insecticides such as synthetic pyrethroids or organophosphates to extend the utility of those um, products. Uh, so, so there are two, two areas there that we think are um, areas for potential that, that would be good to explore further. And lastly, working with flavosone has also give us, given us some insights into its potential mode of action. Obviously, um, it's very important to understand the mode of action of an insecticide, and, and we're very interested to find uh, products that have novel modes of action. In other words, they don't act like a synthetic pyrethroid or an organic phosphate. And we can tell, because a flavosone is active against synthetic pyrethroid resistant mosquitoes, that it is probably not acting like a synthetic pyrethroid. And we don't observe the typical knockdown effect that you would see with an SP. So this tells us that flavosone is probably not acting at the target that is, is typically affected by synthetic pyrethroids. In other words, it's not hitting that voltage-gated sodium channel in the presynapse. What it's hitting, well, I'm let Richard uh, and the company tell you more about that as, as time goes on. The other thing that we can tell from some uh, studies uh, that we've done in the lab is that flavosone is probably not working the way formamidines uh, work. So these are, this is Amitraz, uh, the product used for all sorts of, of um, control, but particularly for mites and ticks, and some botanicals. It's differentiated from these products because we don't see activity um, at a target we call an octopamine receptor. So we think it's probably distinct from the formamidine insecticides as well. And we are wondering if there are opportunities here um, for a, a product with a novel mode of action um, and perhaps for a unique IRAC classification. So a new box on that big IRAC poster that I showed you. 
um, and that's very, uh, very important. Um, and I think it's fair to say um, that, that that thinking uh, comes not only from our own studies but also from some other studies that uh, Biogene uh, has been, um, some, some research that Biogene has been funding. Um, lastly, um, some of you were asking some questions about ticks. We have done some pilot work with ticks um, and we work with the Lone Star Tick, um, which is a huge pest uh, in the United States. It's a pest of humans and livestock and companion animals. And everything's done in plate format here. So you see the, the little larvae are getting exposed to insecticide in the, in the wells of that plate. And then they get popped into a, a packet and we observe them for 24 to 48 hours. We observe in our pilot studies very rapid toxicity of, of flavosone to ticks. So again this tells us that we have um, potential for a product that might be effective against ticks and other pests within the broader tick mite group, um, which I think uh, complements some of the um, work that Richard was talking about. So what is next? Um, just based on our own observations and also um, having um, explored with Biogene some of the other work that is going on, um, I think it, it's fair to say that there, are, there is a good justification for it further exploring the market potential of, of flavosone. So coming from our own data, uh, we see uh, opportunity to sort of explore more the value proposition around that speed of kill or speed of toxicity that we see and also to look to see um, um, if flavosone can be used uh, in combination with other insecticides uh, or as a replacement product uh, when those insecticides don't work. And finally, I think there's very clear justification for exploring more uh, unique mode of action and IRAC uh, classification. So I'm going to stop, stop there. Um, that concludes uh, my formal presentation. And um, yes, so I'm going to hand back to, to Richard. Oh,